So today we're going to talk about mindset. Mindset is kind of ubiquitous, like culture, it's everywhere, but are we really sure what it means? It can also have a significant impact on our productivity, our effectiveness and success, but how to make it happen, that's all coming up right now. Hi there, I'm Andrea Adams. This is the HR Hub and we talk about anything related to HR. I encourage you to please subscribe to the show, click like, or check me out on the podcast. So today my guest is Mitch Horner. Mitch is a managing partner at the Arbinger Institute and an author of more than one book. He's known, which is relevant to the show today, for his work on the outward mindset where he explores the practical effects of mindset on individuals and organizations. So that's gonna help us out today. He's had clients like NASA, Citrix and Universal Studios. Hi Mitch, how are you? Hey Andrea, really well. Great to be on the show, thanks. Well, great to have you on. How is it consulting to the smart people at NASA? I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> oh, you know, people in the organizations that I work with are amazing people. It's my favorite part of of the work is just yeah. being with those people. But actually with NASA, it was it's interesting. I was with the uh, the folks that run the International Space Station and we were about halfway through our time together and we were talking about mindset and the difficulty of shifting mindset and what that means in terms of their culture. And, and they were explaining what it means to actually get that space station up operating, get the payloads up and which they're setting up all the time. And the, the science is amazing. And I said to this group of, of really amazing, smart scientists, I said, what's harder, the science of getting a rocket up and docking with the space station going at however many thousands of miles an hour, you know, around the earth or, or getting mindset, right. And they said, Oh, no question, Mitch, it's mindset. That's the hardest thing, you know? So yeah, it's so interesting, you know, working with organizations, they, everyone has their unique challenges, but getting mindset, right. It's tough. doesn't matter where you are. doesn't matter where you are. doesn't matter what phase of life you're in. It is totally tough. That's amazing. That really brings some meaning to the work and some, some perspective actually to the work we do in HR. Like it's tough work when you're talking about culture, mindset, and all of this kind of thing. So tell me about mindset. How is it different from, say, attitude? And how is it related to culture? Oh, great questions. Well, look, my attitude, how I'm, how I'm showing up, you know, the feeling that I have about my work and about other people, that's driven by how I see other people. And that's how I really think about mindset, how we at Arbinger think about mindset. It's really about how we see, how I see challenges and opportunities in the world around me. But more than anything, what we find is the defining driver of mindset is how I see myself and other people. And those are really two halves of the same coin. If I see myself, for example, as inferior to you, that means I'm seeing you as superior to me or vice versa. I see myself as superior and better than others. Well, that means I see them in in an opposing way. So I'm always in relation to others and how I see myself and others. It drives everything else. It drives how I feel, my attitude about my work. It also drives my behavior and what I do. And all of that put together, what I do, how I do it, how we go about our work, which is all driven by mindset. That's how I think about culture. You know, culture is really how we go about our work, how we do our work together. Uh, and we find that more than anything, Mindset is driving that, how I see myself and how I see all the people that I'm working with in any given moment. When you, you're that leader in that room with those employees, what's the mindset you need to bring? Like it's, it's a mindset that allows you to say, how can I help these people instead of how can I make them do what I need them to do? two drastically different mindsets. In one mindset, it's really about me, my my objectives, my goals. It's all self-focused. And we call that here at Arbinger in our work, we call that an inward mindset. Oh. But it doesn't mean I'm malicious. It's just that my whole orientation of the world is about my objectives, what I'm trying to get done, which is very different than an outward mindset when I see everybody around me as a person who matters just like I matter. 
And because you matter, then your needs and your goals and your objectives, those all matter to me. So anything that I'm going to be doing, it doesn't mean I don't have objectives. It doesn't have mean I don't have needs and priorities. It's just that everything that I'm doing has to take your needs and your priorities and your objectives into account. Mm -hmm. So I see that and I'm alive to, and I'm curious about that. And in my experience, the more alive I am to you as a human being, if you matter the way I matter, if you count the way I count, I can't help but take your objectives into account and the way I go about accomplishing mine. So, you know, one way I think I try to think about it is that with an inward mindset, I'm just focused on my objectives, but with an outward mindset, I'm focused on ours. Mm-hmm. Mine don't go away, but we're trying to accomplish those together. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about mindset, I'm like so off track already, but when we talk about mindset, the type of mindset you're talking about is an outward mindset. Uh, Because there's lots of different kinds of mindsets, but the one you're really advocating for is that outward mindset. Yeah. And it's the reason why it's so powerful is because everything that I do, I do with others. Mm -hmm. So there are discussions about mindset that's just relative to me, you know, a fixed mm-hmm. or growth mindset, an open or closed yes, mindset. Yes, yes. It's just about me, but it's not about us. Mm-hmm. And everything that I am is in connection. It's in relationship. So in an organization, when you think about culture, everything comes down to us, how I'm seeing the people that I'm impacting. You know, when I think about my work, there's nothing that I do that isn't designed or intended to help someone else. So how I see you whether you're an obstacle to me or just a vehicle to get something done or whether you're actually a person that matters. And so what you're trying to do matters. That changes everything in an organization, everything. Uh, I did some episodes. These are my favorite ones to refer to on trust and how in building trust, you have to care about the individual. And you're talking about that, but just a different angle, that care, really caring about all the people around you. However, just to... Uh, get a bit technical for a minute and get back on track a little bit <laughs> with what I had planned. Mindset in general, whether it's outward mindset, growth mindset, whatever the mindset is, can you tell me why it's important to get that right, to think about the idea of mindset and what mindset you're trying to cultivate? Look, think think about the results that, that you're achieving right now in an organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All of those are being driven by the collective behaviors. Yeah. It's just the sum total of the behaviors is the result that you're getting. And of course, there's other you know factors like your market conditions and things like that. But ultimately, you know that the collective behaviors of all the people together add up to the result that you're getting. And because we know that, it's just clear on its face. When we want a better result, a new result, then the typical way we try to get there is to prescribe the behaviors that we know would be happening in order to achieve that new result. Behaviors that aren't happening today. People typically know, they know, you know, I know how we're all acting together. I know how we're behaving. And I know how we would have to behave if we wanted to get a better result. And knowing that, what we typically try to do is just prescribe all of those behaviors. We say, okay, instead of acting this way, we're all going to act that way because if we act that way, we'll get that result. But what that doesn't take into account is the fact that all of those behaviors are just an outgrowth of how we see our mindset. There's a reason why we're behaving in a particular way. It's because of the way we see. And so if we try to just shift those behaviors, and you know, you like, you think about how people go about organizational change. They do that. You know, we, we go, you know, I, I need to be a better leader. Okay, what are the practices that I could adopt of better leaders? But it's not about that. It's about how I see. And, and what I've noticed in my work particularly prior to becoming a part of Arbinger, when I was a client of Arbinger in healthcare and we were turning around healthcare organizations, what happened was if we could just shift the mindset that was driving all those behaviors, Mm -hmm. then the behaviors that should be happening, they actually start happening spontaneously. You don't have to go around and prescribe them. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, you know, Andrew, you know, you can't. Like from an HR perspective, Uh there's no way you can like, Think through in advance all of the problems, all the situations that could arise. And then you're going to, what, put in a binder? Okay, here's how you're going to act when that happens. No, no, no. You just have to change the way people see. And then when people change how they see, they change what they do. And you get a better result. You know, it's um, interesting. McKinsey did this really interesting 
longitudinal study across many organizations over many years. And what they found was that organizations that identify and address pervasive mindsets at the outset, at the beginning, are four times more likely to succeed at changing whatever it is they're trying to change than organizations that overlook that stage and go directly to behavior change. Four times more likely to change behavior, no matter what it is in the organization, if you change mindset first. Can we talk about how to change mindset? If you had advice for the HR people out there that were thinking of, let's just change their behavior and the mindset will follow. Instead, reverse that, let's change the mindset and the behavior will follow. What advice do you have for them? Well, I think it goes all the way to redefining what it means to have a job. If you think about like a typical job description, what does it include? It includes my roles. Often it'll include yep. the tasks and activities, responsibilities, but notice, I can, I can think about all of that with an inward mindset. And oftentimes, the incentives that we have reinforce just thinking about that. But it's what we were talking about before. If you think about any task or activity, any role that I have in an organization, any objective, there's really nothing that isn't in service of someone else, some other person in the organization or group in the organization or team or a customer outside the organization. And all of those individuals, those people, they have objectives. And so what I have to do in order to shift the mindset, in order to shift people from this fundamentally inward mindset to an outward mindset where I'm alive to and I'm interested in other people, I have to think about my job in terms of those other people. That everything that I do impacts someone else. It could be a coworker or a customer or a direct report or my own manager. And now, rather than just thinking about, well, I got to get my stuff done and I got to accomplish my objectives, it's, wait, what are they trying to accomplish? And now, what could I do, given the tasks and objectives and responsibilities I have to do that in a way that helps them accomplish their objective? You do that, everything changes. The friction and the silos and the, and the you know, all of the people drama where people where people are getting crossways of each other goes away because now everyone's thinking about their jobs in terms of who do I impact? And now I need to measure myself and my success in terms of whether those people are achieving their objectives, not just whether I'm achieving mine. Nothing, nothing will change the mindset in an organization faster than helping people rethink what it means to have a job in your organization. You take people through what does it mean to have a job workshops? Like, what does that oh, mean? Oh, absolutely. Like that? Yeah. You, you, you know, when, when, when you take people through an experience where they begin to rethink what it means to have a job, the first thing that happens is they begin to see ways that they've created problems for others that they've just been absolutely blind to. Yes. Oh, man, this is resonating. <laughs> yeah. And then the next thing that happens is then they want to get really curious. They think, well, okay, what, well, what, what are you trying to accomplish? And you facilitate that. You know, you give people time and space to go, go ask people, you know, what is it you're trying to accomplish? And how, how does someone in my role help or get in the way of that? Okay. And now everybody is thinking about ways that they could do their work in a way that helps other people accomplish their objectives. And it's invigorating. I mean, it just, Totally. The energy that people feel when they start to think about their work in terms of its impact is, it's remarkable. Isn't in the Gallup survey, one of the key indicators of engagement is understanding the impact or the purpose of the role. I'm pretty sure it's one of the 12. Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. So you've been talking about an outward mindset. What do you, what other kinds of mindsets do we foster? Or is that just that's the one we need to foster. Like what well, about growth mindset, for example, or maybe a safety mindset? Sounds a lot like safety culture and yeah. All of those are important. And, and I think there's value in all of that. I just, I've come to feel over time, both as an operator in an organization that's trying to lead and change a culture, as well as helping other organizations, that 
any one of those that's taken in isolation that becomes a project for me can too easily get in the way of what we're trying to do together. Because, it, because as a project about me, it keeps me focused on me. You know, you think about safety, for example. It's been remarkable to see what happens to safety in an organization when people start thinking about their jobs in terms of who is impacted by this. Rather than going, I got to stay safe, I got to stay safe, what am I supposed to do, right? What are all the behaviors I'm supposed to do in order to stay safe? Because that's compliance. And I can maliciously comply or I can passively comply or whatever. But then you get a whole group of people going, huh, what are these people trying to accomplish? Wait, they're people. Now they're coming up with ways to ensure safety that no one could prescribe. And that's the, I mean, you take safety as a very narrow example that has mm -hmm. huge ripple effects. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing we're talking about. There's no one who could think through in advance. Here's all the unsafe situations that could arise. You just need people who are so alive to their impact on others that they see the problem. They're the ones that are coming up with the solution because they're closest to it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has a brain in this organization. Everybody's thinking about impact. So here's a question I've been thinking about as you've been talking. It's about, well, values. You know, we could have a value of care for each other, for example. Is that the same thing? And in any case, can you just talk about how mindset relates to mission, vision, values? Mission and vision. Let's start with that. So many of those statements, they're just statements, right? Mm -hmm. they, people lock a door. They come up with something, they print it on posters, they put it all over the building. But oftentimes those, as good as they are, they, they also suffer from an inward mindset because they're really about us as an organization. What are we trying to be? You know, the, you take a typical kind of mission or vision formula, it's that we want to be this. You know, yeah. we want to be recognized as that or whatever the case might be. Yeah. And that might be really motivating and energizing and mobilizing for the C-suite that came up with it. But what about what about the people that are actually doing the work? What, what energizes them? Is it to create some great organization or is it to, to do something for people that being a part of this organization they can do? Something that's way bigger than us as an organization. You know, there was a, there was a man named Bill Bartman who we wrote about in our book, The Outward Mindset. He's passed away now, but he created this company called CFS2, and it was the replacement for the much less successful CFS, um, mm -hmm. the first the first one. Right. And it's a debt collection agency. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but working but at a debt collection agency, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. But even for the people that work for him, both the first time and the second time, you know, what are you doing? You're calling people. It's part of your work. This is your job to call people and to get them to pay you when they're probably not that well equipped to pay you. It's the last thing that they probably want to do. And it may be the last thing that, that they can afford to do. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, they could come up with a mission or a vision about who they wanted to be and uh, relative to competitors and their success and their, 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 uh, collection rate or whatever it is. Yeah. You know? But, but Bill, he started to talk to the people that are doing the work and he said, you know, tell me about it. You know, what are you doing? He said, well, it's really hard, the people said, because these people, they can't pay us. Otherwise, they would have paid us. Yeah. And so, you know, they had been thinking about their job in terms of debt collection, but he said, well, what do you think we need to do for these people? And they said, well, nothing's going to happen unless they have a job. So he said, well, well, do whatever you think you should do to help them in whatever way they need to pay the debt that they have. Mm -hmm. And they started to help people get jobs. They, they literally started to get on the phone with these people, learn about their circumstances, learn about their skills and said, well, let's help you get a job. And they would rewrite their resumes. They would take wow. them through interviewing practices. They found that they were so down and out that they would have to call them the morning of the interview to make sure that they're out of bed. Then they also found that, you know, there were all sorts of priorities these people had that weren't paying this particular debt. You know, some, a tree had fallen on their house, you know, in a windstorm or someone's mom had passed away and there were, you know, all of the funeral costs. And so they started to look around and they said, there's, there's over 10,000 nonprofits that 
are just set up to solve each one of these issues. And so they started to connect these people. Mm. And what started to happen was these people started to get on their feet. And of course, when they started to get money that they didn't have before, who do they want to pay? They wanted to pay their friends at CFS2. This organization ended up becoming in their debt collection, just their core metrics, mm -hmm. how much they were able to collect on all of the outstanding debt. They were three times the next best competitor in the industry on that single metric, but it invigorated the people. They loved what they did because they started to see their work in mm -hmm. terms of people and the innovation that that unlocked. They realized, yeah, we're a debt collection company. What we really are is we're getting people a job and getting people back on their feet company so that they can pay this debt. No one else had done that before. It was innovation that was unlocked when people started to become connected to a mission and a vision that was bigger than their company. I have a question about that story. Is the guy, yeah. is the CFS2 still in business? Yeah, as far as I know. Last time I, I, I talked to Bill was prior to his passing, um, but I'd imagine that they're still the industry leader. Uh, I, I probably need to go back and check. It's been a year or two, but yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. All right. Well, I'm going to ask this question, and it was not informed by this conversation. It was a question I dreamed up before we ever had the conversation, but Great. I think I know what the answer is going to be. However, <laughs> well, I'll just ask it anyway. How do, we, how do we identify the mindset we need in an organization, or is there just the one mindset of getting together and looking outwards? People that know what the culture is that they want. Mm -hmm. If they just think about what it would look like if people were fully outward together, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to start to imagine what you could accomplish. But oftentimes there isn't the impetus. There's not enough motivation inside of an organization to do the work to shift that mm -hmm. because it's hard because, you know, we're all accustomed to trying to shift behavior. We don't, we don't really know how to shift mindset. So part of it is part of developing that groundswell of interest and desire to finally shift the mindset comes from recognizing the cost. What is the cost of not shifting that mindset? What, what's happening right now in the organization that if we were to be able to, to finally eradicate the blame and the friction and the drama, what, what could happen? You know, sometimes with organizations, we help people actually put a number on that, like the financial cost. Mm -hmm of operating with an inward mindset. And it's mind blowing. But until you kind of get down to those brass tacks, it's hard sometimes because you're still surviving, you know, and maybe even think you're thriving. But if you're really honest with yourself, you can begin to pitch through what could happen in your organization if everybody was thinking about their jobs in terms of who I impact. And my responsibility is to make sure that my impact is exactly what it could be. You start to think about the innovation that that would unlock. And, and when you, when you compare that to the cost of not doing it, it becomes, it becomes for many, the top priority in their organization more than anything else. All right. Uh, we are getting to the end of this. That was so fantastic. Uh, where could someone learn more about what it is you're up to? Yeah. Well, come visit us on the website. It's arbinger.com. We'd love to just set up a conversation with you, but Go online, go on Amazon or wherever you buy books, go and pre-order the latest edition of Leadership oh. and Self-Deception. Mm -hmm. We talk about in that book, it's a fictional story. It's an easy mm -hmm. read, but nothing will give you practical insight as to how to do this, both for yourself as an individual and a mm -hmm. professional, as well as in your personal life, but also how to do that inside of your responsibility as a leader. We published that first in 2000. It sold more copies year after year. It's now at, at 3 million copies and 30 languages, but we've completely rewritten it to be even more practically helpful in this journey that you're on. How do I shift my own mindset and how do I help shift the mindset of others? So go pre-order that. It comes out in August of this year. Okay. Uh, what about the outward mindset? That other That's another book. Yes. The outward mindset yeah. is... It's a more uh, straightforward kind of business book that gives you multiple case studies, the story of CFS2 and many other examples, as well as examples from our organization okay. uh, over the years that give you a, a roadmap 
to show you how to begin to implement that in your organization. Mm. So that's another great resource for readers that are, or listeners who are interested. Well, thanks, Mitch. That was so fantastic. I'm thinking about the idea that we could go back with individuals to their jobs, and maybe it's not individuals, it's a group, and have them think about how their job relates to what other people are trying to do. And I have done some work like that, and so I would encourage you to give it a shot because it is just so powerful and perhaps related back to how much people are searching for meaning and purpose. And this is touching on that. It's a real deep human thing. My mind has kind of gone blind by that conversation and I can't think of another episode that's related. But if I do, when I'm editing, I'm going to put a link to that right here. Thanks for watching out there and see you next time.